Alright, today I'll be doing problem 5.68. I will only be solving it symbolically, so this should be a good uh, example of a type of problem that you will see on the exam, as well as how to solve a problem on the exam without any numbers. Okay, so we have the coefficient of kinetic friction, we have m1, we have alpha, we have the distance x that this falls and the amount of time t that it falls. And we need to find m2. So take a minute, just look it over, uh, solve it if you can, and then just see how I do it. Okay, first, of course, you draw a picture. So, what do we know? We know this is falling. And this is straight down. So we know the force of gravity on this object is m2 times g. Okay. Uh, if this is falling, then this is going up the ramp. If that's going up the ramp, and there's friction, which there is, so we have the, and we have the friction coefficient, then the friction is going in this direction, right? Because this is falling, which is pulling this up, so friction resists this force. Times what? times the normal force, which is going to be pointing up here. Always perpendicular to the surface that it's resting on. So that's going that way, so the normal force is pointing that way. But how hard is it, point, uh, is it pushing against this? This, I think, is where a lot of people get confused. Okay. That's the total force of gravity on this thing, right? That's the total force of gravity. That's not... But that's not how hard it's actually pressing against the ramp, because some force is actually going this way. The force going this way is going to be how much it is inclined to uh, fall down this ramp which has to do with the ratio of the height of the ramp to uh, you know, the hypotenuse so that's going to be M1. I'll have to start farther down. M1 times G times sine alpha. And that is this one here. That's how fast it's going to, the force of it uh, falling down the ramp. Just, yeah. So, of course, there's some tension T up here. We'll deal with that later. And this is the kind of tricky part. Finding the normal force now. So if this is alpha, then this angle here is also alpha. It's your basic uh, geometry. So this is M1 
write it down here. M1 times G times cosine alpha. Right? I'm just I'm just pulling the uh, m1 times g into its parts, right? If I if I drew it in actual proportion, it would be like this. Let's go in there. See? I'm just I'm just pulling it apart into its respective components. This and this. Right? So that's the same. That's the same. All works out. I'm just pulling it into its respective pieces. Okay. So, draw this out again so it's clearer what it belongs to. That's not its actual proportional to the actual amount of the force. Just keep that in mind. Okay. Cool. Um, so, back to T1. This is the interesting thing. What do we know about T1? Well, we know that it's going to be greater than both of these put together because this is falling and pulling this whole thing in this direction. Has to be, because this can't really fall and not pull M1 along with it. So T1 has to be greater, force of the pull has to be greater than those things. T is going that way. And the net amount of force is going to be equal to m1 times a1. However fast it's accelerating, we call that a1. And this lets us write down our first equation. So, t1 minus mu sub k times n, which is equal to this deal right here, times m1 g cosine alpha, and that is this one and T, so we have 1 and 2 out of 4 components for our equation, minus this, because it's pulling it this way. So we define that to be negative. I'll get more on that in a minute. It's another part where people get confused. Alpha is equal to this the sum of the forces, M1, A1. Okay. So that is for the left block, and the second block is much, much easier. So, part of the problem where people get confused is when you draw that axes like this, right? Because believe it or not, that's the easiest way to solve this kind of problem. And it freaks people out because everybody's used to just regular perpendicular kind of axes, right? Just parallel to the ground. But we're really not interested in things that are parallel to the ground, right? Because this is 
how all our things are defined, this and perpendicular to the surface of the triangle. So people get confused because it's a lot easier to write it like this than it is to write it the regular way. But stop thinking about it like changing axes and just think about it like where is stuff moving? Stuff is moving this way, I have forces in this direction and this direction, and also perpendicular to those. So the easiest way to do it is just to say, oh, this will be positive x, and this will be positive y. It's not, you know, anything magical or really complicated. It's just all your forces are going this way or going perpendicular to it. So it's the easiest way to do it. If you're having trouble with that, it might be helpful to look at page 138, example 5.4, and check that out. They explain it fairly well, um, but really, the thing to remember is, where are my forces going? Because that's all you care about. So you orient your axes according to how your forces are. It's that simple. Okay, and that's all I'll be saying about that. We'll take that as implicit for the rest of the problem. Okay. So we have the forces for the left block. On the right block, we have m2 times g. That's just the force of gravity. Oh, don't let it bother you that these axes this way and this way are different than this. I know that's going to bother you, but don't let it, because these are essentially separate. You don't care about the angle between these two things, right? I mean, it, it makes no difference to you whether uh, this is, you know, somewhere else than this, because the force is perfectly transferred by this wheel. So the angle between the two axes is made irrelevant. Okay, so m2 times g is our downward force. And we have some upward force, call it t2. And that is it for the second box. Oh, well, I should say the net acceleration is, of course, going to be equal to m2a2. Write that so you can see it. There we go. Okay, that lets us write our second equation. This one is going to be T2 minus M2G is equal to M2A2. It's a lot nicer than our uh, first equation was looking. Okay, but once you have the equations, you're all set. Because now, you just have to figure out... Sorry about this, it actually looks like this rope is not connected. Definitely is. Okay. Anyway, once you have the equations, it's much easier. Because then you just say, well, T2 is equal to T1. It has to be, because it's the same rope. So the tension in this part of the rope isn't going to be different from the tension in this part of the rope. So T1 is equal to T2. And we'll just say, we'll just call them both T. And erase those. T. 
and t. Okay, well that's good. That got rid of a variable. And since this is being pulled down, right? This is being pulled this way. And the, as fast as this is accelerating down, the force on this is equal to the force of this, right? If the force of this going down is the same as the force of up here. And that means that the acceleration is going to be the same. Because, uh, think of it this way. It's the same rope. They're connected. So if this is going down, this, whatever acceleration this has, has to be mimicked by this, because, you know, they're connected. I can't pull my hand this way without pulling my right along with it. So a1 is equal to a2 is equal to a. All right. Well, this is looking nicer now. I'll have to start erasing things, though. Okay. So, good. We're doing good. Alright, now we want to solve for M2, so we want to set one of the equations, say, here, this is just one way to do it, set one of the equations equal to T, okay, let's do it with the first one. It's equal to... Right, that's our friction force, and plus and one more and one times. Okay, so that's T. And we want to... So now we have an expression for T that we can substitute into the other equation, which was just T the other equation, which was just T minus M to G equal to M to A. So we just get rid of this and plug in this expression, this whole thing, in for T. I did not give myself enough room. Okay, well do what I can be easier to write it up here and down there okay so that's T so that will be minus Two G equal to M two A. Okay, not as neat as I would have liked, but but 
but you get the idea. Okay. I raced too much. There we go. So now we just solve for M2. We're almost there, I promise. Solve for M2. That's going to give you. times I'm just gonna write it all in green save myself some trouble G plus a is equal to u sub k times m1 G cosine alpha plus m1 G sine alpha plus m1 a so you're going to erase part of my picture don't want to bother you just so it's easier to see the equation okay good just one more step we say m2 Save myself some trouble. Because they all have M1 in them. And divide that by... G plus A. Okay. Unfortunately, we're not quite done. Because even though we have M2, we do not have A yet. But we can find it, so do not despair. Write this down. Don't lose it. Okay. So remember, in the original problem, we were given how far it fell in a certain time t. So what do we know that relates time and position? Hopefully you all said the position function really loudly and excitedly. I'll pretend that you did. So x x is I'm just writing the position function down is equal to x naught, your original position, plus v naught, your original acceleration, times t, plus one half a, your acceleration, times t squared. It's just the position function. Can't be new to anyone. Okay. We have x. That was one of our givens at the beginning of the problem. And we have t. This we know is 0, because there was no initial position given. And v naught is equal to 0, because the system started from rest, also given in the problem. So x is equal to one half a t squared two x divided by t squared is equal to your acceleration. So plug that back in 
to the equation we got a minute ago for m, and you are done. That was a bit longer than I expected, but we got a good answer, and hopefully that clears up some of this friction and ramp trouble you guys may have been having.